Today I'm going to tell you guys about my work studying sexually dimorphic nervous system development in C. elegans. So sexual dimorphism is common across animal species, and there are several traits of sexual dimorphism that are also common across animal species. One of these is that if you look in juveniles of a species, like these very cute ducklings here, you can't tell males and females apart. But once an animal reaches adulthood, they develop overt sexual dimorphisms, and they also develop stereotype sexually dimorphic behaviors. And this is exciting for neurobiologists because when you see a species performing um, a stereotype behavior, it suggests that there's a neural circuit underlying this behavior. And so C. elegans is a really great model for studying sexual dimorphism because C. elegans has two sexes, an XX hermaphrodite. Somatically, this is just a female animal with a special germline that can produce sperm for a short period of time, and an XO male. The soma of these animals is known to be very sexually dimorphic in all tissue types. So the C. elegans intestine, hypodermis, which is the skin of the animal, the somatic gonad, and the germline, of course, um, is very sexually dimorphic. And this sexual dimorphism extends to the nervous system. So each sex has what we call the sex-specific neurons. So these are neurons that are present in one sex, but not the other. But the core of the nervous system, 294 of these neurons are shared between the two sexes. So if you consider molecular identity and anatomical features, you can identify the same neuron in males and in hermaphrodites. Very recently, in addition to the complete neural connectome of a hermaphrodite animal, which has been around for several decades now, the complete neural connectome of a male animal was also elucidated. And so this allows us to take every neuron in each sex um, and analyze the connection that, every, that each of these neurons makes to one another. And this was done by reconstructing EM micrographs. And so you'll note that this male connectome came out very recently. So we're very recently able to appreciate that sexual dimorphism in the nervous system is not just in terms of these sex-specific neurons, but also that sex-shared neurons make very sexually dimorphic connections. So today I'm going to tell you about um, work that I've done on the global sex determination pathway in C. elegans, tissue-specific effectors, and the role that environmental factors have, all in specifying the way that this nervous system develops sexually dimorphically. So the global sex determination pathway in C. elegans was described over 40 years ago. And basically what this pathway does is it measures how many X chromosomes you have, because that differentiates between hermaphrodites and males. And through a series of genetic repressive interactions, culminates in this transcription factor called TRA1. And so TRA1 is expressed in a hermaphrodite animal to promote female fates in the soma and to repress male fates. Although we've known for a long time now that TRA1 is the master regulator of sex determination in the soma, we actually know very little about the uh, characteristics of its expression. So one of the things that I did in my PhD is to use an endogenously GFP-tagged version of TRA1 to just ask, what is the expression dynamics of the TRA1 master regulator of sex determination? And C. elegans goes through several larval stages before molting into the reproductive adult. And what we find in the adult is what you would expect of a master regulator of sex determination, is that we see TRA1 expression in all tissue types ubiquitously in these tissue types. So this was pretty understandable to us. What's interesting is that if you look in early larval stages, like this L1 stage, you find a much more restricted pattern of TRA1 expression. So TRA1 is expressed in just two pairs of neurons, in the intestine, in the somatic gonad, and in some muscle cells. But it's by no means ubiquitous, and it's not at all in all tissue types yet. And so this suggests that there is a very dynamic process that's happening between juvenile stages and adulthood to regulate sexual maturation, including at the topmost level of the sex determination pathway. C. elegans also has an alternate developmental pathway called the dower stage. And this happens when animals uh, encounter environmental stressors, and this allows them to enter a diapause stage for months until conditions improve, and then they exit the dower stage and continue reproductive development into adulthood. I found that in the dower stage, TRA1 expression is actually much less uh, than normally in developing animals, so it's actually shut off in all tissue types except the somatic gonad, suggesting that the environmental factors that impact um, on larval development also impact on the sex determination pathway. And this is a theme I'm going to come back to later. 
So TRA1 is expressed in all of these tissues, and we know that all of these tissues are sexually dimorphic, but TRA1 does not do all of these jobs by itself. So downstream of TRA1, a family of transcription factors that's known as the DMRT family is directly regulated by TRA1 activity. And these have been shown to specify sexual dimorphism of restricted tissue types, like the intestine or the epidermis of the worms. This gene family is very broadly conserved across the animal kingdom. So here I'm showing you conservation across all bilaterians. You'll notice that uh, here I've highlighted the C. elegans orthologs in black. There's this nematode-specific expansion over here. So C. elegans actually has a lot uh, of extra DMRT genes. But I'm going to focus today on one highly conserved member of this family. In C. elegans, this is called DMD4. And previously, nothing was known about DMD4. I generated an endogenous GFP-tagged version of the DMD4 locus. And unsurprisingly, based on what we know about the role of DMD genes uh, in specifying sexual dimorphism, we did find sexually dimorphic expression of DMD4. And this expression is very limited to two pairs of neurons in the tail of the animal. So you'll see that in a hermaphrodite animal, we can see expression in all larval stages and in adulthood. Whereas in males, this expression is present uh, in larval stages, but is shut off at the transition to adulthood. Again, suggesting that there's strong temporal regulation to sexual maturation. Now, the expression in these two neurons was very exciting for us because a lot is known about these two neurons and their sexually dimorphic connectivity and function. So here I'm showing you um, a highlight of the circuit that these two neurons participate in. And this is based on that EM connectome that I showed you earlier. And so if we look at um, each neuron here is represented by a shape, and here each arrow represents a synaptic connection. For instance, we can see that this PHB neuron synapses onto another shared interneuron called ABA. In the male, this connection is absent, and PHB instead synapses onto other sex-shared interneurons and also onto some of the male-specific neurons. We were able to generate transgenic tools that allow us to label these connections in live animals so we could look one by one in these connections um, in a larger population of animals and across developmental time. And I'm just going to schematize that work for you here. So we labeled three connections that the phasmid neurons make, some that are hermaphrodite specific and some that are male specific. And we find that in juvenile animals, these connections are actually present in both sexes. And then during sexual maturation, they're pruned away to get to the adult sexually dimorphic connectivity. Interestingly, this mirrors the expression pattern that we saw of DMD4, where you have non-dimorphism until sexual maturation. And then in adulthood, this expression finally becomes dimorphic. So very simply, I wanted to ask whether DMD4 functions in generating this sexual dimorphism. And again, I'll schematize this for you that compared to a wild type animal where all these connections get pruned away to get you adult sexual dimorphism, in DMD4 mutants, hermaphrodites are specifically defective in pruning away these synaptic connections, so they maintain non-dimorphism into adulthood, and this also has behavioral consequences for these animals. So I've shown you that there is strong uh, genetic control over the way that sexual dimorphism develops, both in the broad level of the TRA1 transcription factor and the more tissue-specific example of DMD4 and just two neuron pairs. I've also told you that TRA1 can be regulated by passage through the dower stage, suggesting that environmental factors can also impact the way that sexually dimorphic development occurs. And so knowing that um, sexual dimorphically expressed genes are affected by environmental factors, we wanted to ask whether this had any functional consequence. And so to answer that question, we turn again to the phasmid sensory circuit where we have really well characterized um, sexual dimorphisms and just ask, OK, in animals that go through the dower stage, are there any defects in how these sexual dimorphisms arise? I found that in animals that have been passed through the dower stage, hermaphrodites are able to recover just fine and prune their connections away normally. But in male animals that have been through the dower stage, they fail to prune these connections. So they kind of remain in a juvenile state in terms of their synaptic connectivity. I was specifically able to show that the environmental stressor of starvation is what causes this and not dower passage per se. And this is because that when an animal undergoes larval starvation, it actually generates a long-term defect in serotonin signaling. So what happens is that reduction in serotonin signaling tells the phasmid neurons that they're not going to prune these connections. And what this looks like in the worm is that normally where you have this nice, healthy serotonin spike that tells the nervous system sexual maturation is starting, 
In the case of animals that have been starved, the spike never happens. And so you get males that maintain this juvenile connectivity. So just to reiterate what I've told you today, at the level of, level of global sex determination, the trial one transcription factor is expressed ubiquitously in hermaphrodites, but this is extremely dynamic and regulated both by development and by environmental factors. Downstream of trial one, there are tissue specific effectors that tell specific cell types how to develop in a sexually dimorphic way. And environmental factors can also impact this by interacting with neurotransmitter signaling and changing the way that sexual dimorphism develops. With that, I would like to thank the Hobart Lab, uh, labs that generated strains and reagents, the sources of funding. And of course, I would like to acknowledge that it's a great honor to be here today and to be presented with this award. So thank you all for your attention. Thank you. Thank you.